Alright, so the next two chapters are going to go over the turn newborn in chapter 12, and then a few of the abnormal uh, things you're going to be looking for for chapter 13 in the newborn. So, looking at the adjustment of life outside the uterus. So this is right after they're born. Uh, lots of factors can affect how they adjust, some of them being when they were still in utero, looking at the those patients that were high risk, preeclampsia, gestational diabetes, and then how safe the delivery was, the fetal distress, how they delivered, C-section, was it an emergency C-section under a general, and then also looking at uh, how their care, that first month of life, on how they're taken care of. So respirations are uh, stimulated due to chilling and chemical changes in the blood. So sensory and physical stimuli, the first breath opens up those alveoli, and then independent air exchange begins. So uh, what is the nurse's role in providing sensory and physical stimuli to assist the newborn in breathing? That would be initially using that bulb suction and syringe, and then also to uh, tapping maybe the bottom of the foot of the baby or rubbing the back, doing something that's going to help have that have that infant take their first breath. So when observing the newborn, the nurse identifies expected normal findings, but then also need, they need to have in the back of their head what can go wrong, what is abnormal, uh, and anything that's abnormal with an infant needs to be reported to the healthcare provider or the RN, and depending on the situation. So looking at their nervous system, they have multiple reflexes that are going to help them to survive and some of the main ones are you know, sneezing, sucking, gagging, um, they're also able to you know, cry, swallow, and then they can lift their head slightly and as they age they will have more head control and neck control. A few other reflexes that they have are the ones listed here and you can go on to YouTube to watch the video on these reflexes, it's going to be better than just describing them when you can actually see what they actually look like. So when the head comes out, not all the time, but oftentimes there is a little bit of molding and that's because those sutures, as you can see from the picture here, they can move a little bit on here so they're able to mold for that head to come out. So it's important to let the patients know that that molding will go away. Sometimes it may take a few days, uh, but just to just to let them know that their heads won't look like that for the rest of their lives. And there is something called a caput, which is more than more than the molding. So you can see from A, a is the just the molding, and then this one is the caput, so it's more and it has a little bit more swelling as well. You also may see a cephalohematoma, and that is the collection of blood, and it doesn't cross the suture line. So a distinction of seeing a cephalohematoma is that it'll only be on one side of the head. So you'll just see bulging on one side but not the other. So ears. Uh, should be well developed. They're going to be small. They normally are placed just the bottom of it's kind of right where the, the mouth is. And hearing screenings are going to be done before the baby is discharged. Sometimes they fail the hearing screen and if that's the case it's important to at least try it once or maybe even twice at, if they fail because it could just be that the infant was too awake or fussy at the time, or there might just be a little too much amniotic fluid in their ears and taking a little bit longer for that fluid to come out. So you just want to reassure the, the parents that if they fail once, that it may not mean anything and that they're going to be re retesting that hearing screen. If they do fail two or three times, then, then they would need to be referred. So visual for the infant, uh, they can see a little bit, but not much. And here's a picture on the bottom that kind of shows what their vision looks like. So they don't really have full vision until about six months. 
and they don't actually have tears until about one to three months of age. Sleep. So infants sleep a lot. Uh, they're exhausted from all the work that they had to do to be delivered. It's uh, about 12 to 20 hours a day in the beginning. So when they're first born, for that first hour or so, they're actually very awake and active, which is why it's really important to get that infant to uh, bond with the parents and to start breastfeeding because that's the time that they're going to be um, really awake to have a really good breastfeed is that first time. And then after that, they'll go through a sleepy phase. And then after that sleepy phase, they'll have that second reactivity and then they'll kind of go to normal um, after that. So, so looking at pain, sometimes it's hard to assess pain with an infant because they can't tell you on a scale of zero to 10 what their pain is. So it's important to look at their um, signs and symptoms to look for to see what is this infant experiencing pain. So and then some pain relief is going to be swaddling, cuddling, um, non-intrusive sucking, having a quiet environment. Uh, oral sucrose can be given. Uh, it's not as common of a practice anymore to give it uh, frequently how it used to be. Normally it's just given during a circumcision or any other minor procedures that need to occur. Uh, you don't want to give too much oral sucrose because it can um, make the infant feel full and then they're not going to have those feeding cues and want to feed when they need to have that nutrient in their body. So there's lots of different pain assessment tools. So it pretty much depends on the facility that you work at and what tool they're going to use. Uh, I frequently use the NIPS tool, the pain scale. Uh, there's CRIES. I think Children's uses the FLACC. It just all depends on where you're at. So conditioned responses. So a response of a reflex that is learned over time. So an example of this is that if the infant um, is hungry, they stop crying when they hear their mother's voice because they know that um, food is normally available during that time. Even if it's not, they'll calm down from it because it's associated with that. So um, it's important to do those, you know, have those um, cues with the infant and that bonding to help relieve some of their pain and to help them um, have a nice transition into the outside environment. So the respiratory. Uh, once then a bill cord is clamped and cut, those lungs take function and um, the first breath helps to expand those lungs and then full expansion actually doesn't occur for quite a few days. So, and then know that that most important period is the first hour of life and newborn should be positioned on their back or side to help maintain patient airway and there's that big campaign for the back to sleep to help reduce the amount of SIDS. Okay, AFGAR score. We've gone over this quite a bit in Sim Lab. So we have the um, five different objectives that are measured. And you're looking at all the different, you know, the picture here of respiratory rate, heart rate, muscle tone, reflex, and color. It's important to look at to see if there's sternal retractions because that is showing that they're, the infant's having a hard time with their respirations and a hard time breathing. So um, if you do see sternal retractions on the infant, that needs to be reported immediately. So question one, an APGAR score of five at five min minutes indicates the neonate is in. The answer would be three, poor condition. So, um, not quite critical because critical would be when there's quite a few zeros going on and uh, respirations and the apps, heart rate's absent, but five is still a concern and interventions need to be done. So the infant would be in a poor condition at this point. Circulatory system. So they have about 300 milliliters of blood. Um, depends upon ducts within the heart to close certain times and points in time. 
And the ducks, if the ducks fail to close when they're supposed to, the neonate become, may become cyanotic because of blood bypasses the lungs and does not pick up any oxygen. So providing warmth, we talked a lot about this, the importance of thermoregulation. Um, they have a hard time doing that on their own, so interventions need to occur to be able to help with that. So their sweat glands don't function during the neonatal period, so an infant is at a risk of developing an elevated temperature. So we talk a lot about you know, making sure that the infant stays warm, uh, putting, you know, swaddling them, maybe putting them under a radiant warmer, you know, doing all that to keep them warm, but also too, it's important to not, not overheat them either. So just maintaining that thermal regulation of that optimal temperature is very important in the infant. So a temperature can be taken under the armpit or rectally. Uh, the axilla is the place of choice. Uh, rectally doesn't occur as much anymore, but it's still they still can do it if needed, if there's any concerns. Um, that, so here are just some of, um, of vitals that need to be reported. So it would be a temperature, if it's above or below, um, pulse rate respirations, noisy respirations. One of those, would, an example of that would be if the infant was, was called grunting, so they have making that grunting sound when they're breathing, and that's just showing that they're struggling with it. So nasal flaring, if their nostrils are flaring, or um, chest retractions, or those sternal, you know, also called the sternal retractions. So those are all concerns that that infant is not breathing properly. So question two, an infant's vital signs are assessed as follows. We have the temperature of 96.5, pulse 125, respirations 44. The nurse is aware that the temperature is decreased. All the other vitals look okay. So here's just a picture of different ways to maintain that body temperature. I uh, want to make sure to keep, keep their hat, head covered so with a hat they can easily lose temperature through their head. Uh, make sure there's not a draft. Um, you're not placing them on a cold surface. So there's lots of different interventions the nurse can do to help maintain that temperature. All right, so musculoskeletal. Those movements are random and uncoordinated when you see an infant moving. Um, the head and neck muscles are the first ones to gain control. So here are the average length and weight of an infant. So looking at the pounds or um, the grams here. Um, so if an infant is less than six pounds, they're gonna be considered SGA, small for gestational age, or if they're above, there was a number we had, it was 8.8, um, .8, but just kind of have the average of 6.9 here. So looking at to see if they're SGA or LGA. So in the first three to four days after birth, the infant loses about five to 10% of their body weight. Um, so the reason may be just that withdrawal from maternal hormones, fluid shifts, uh, the loss of feces and urine. So it's important to weigh the infant daily to see where that percentage is and to see if you know, it, as long as it's it's expected to be losing some weight, but you don't want it to be more than 10%. If the infant was to lose 8%, you know, you'd kind of want to watch and see what's going on. Um, and then if there's a 10% or higher loss, that's going to need to be reported either to the nurse, provider, or pediatrician, whatever your policy states. So that needs to be reported right away uh, to see what the reasons are on why they're losing more than what it should be. Is it because the infant is not feeding properly? They don't have a good latch and they're not getting enough, uh, enough nutrients in them. So the kidneys are not fully developed at birth. So it's important for the nurse to note that first void. That's because to see A, if, um, mainly to see if everything is working properly, that the kidneys are working properly, 
that uh, everything is uh, functioning the way that it should. So newborns should have about six wet diapers a day. And if there's less than that, you're going to be worried about, you know, the, with the feeding as well as that infant getting enough or are the kidneys working properly. So with the male genitalia, the testes do descend in the scrotum before birth. So you do want to check and make sure both those are descended um, after the delivery with your newborn initial newborn assessment. So it's up to the parents if they want to have their child circumcised or not. So there are a few benefits, um, also a few disadvantages, but uh, so benefits are going to be decrease the risk of um, cancer, fewer UTIs, fewer STIs, uh, disadvantages. There is a risk of getting an infection from the surgery. Um, doesn't happen often as long as the parents are doing proper care after the circumcision. And there is a potential of bleeding from this incision, but that doesn't happen often either. And as long as the um, nurses are checking that incision frequently right in the beginning, um, any of that little extra bleeding can be stopped. So um, normally it's not too much of a concern. So you want to make sure that the infant is stable before doing that circumcision. You want to make sure that their temperature is, uh, is fine, that they're not hypoglycemic, that they're, you know, all of their vital signs are stable. So then the female genitalia, um, it might be a little swollen, so that's okay. Also, too, there may be some white or blunted mu mucus discharge, which is okay, too. There's no intervention that needs to be done, and that's caused just by that hormonal withdrawal from the mother. So it's important to teach parents to clean from front to back when they're changing the infant's diaper to... Um, decrease that risk of infection. Okay, so looking at the skin on an infant, when you're doing your assessment, you want to check for turgor and the overall skin condition. So here's just a few different um, things that you're going to be assessing and looking at. So they may have vernix on them, which is okay. That's fine. Some people call that the a natural uh, skin protectant or a natu natural conditioning for the infant. So that's okay for them to have that on there. Um, jaundice is not normal, so you want to assess for that. You're looking for that yellow tinge of the skin, and that is associated with bilirubin. So that is something that you do want to look for and, and report if you see that. Mongolian spots, those are, those are okay more common with dark skinned babies. Uh, here's a picture of what it could look like. So it almost just looks like a bruise on there. So that's important to uh, document on your first assessment. So that way in following assessments, the nurses know that it's a mongolian spot, not a bruise. So it was there at birth and not, and it wasn't um, showed up later. And then the milia, which are tiny white bumps across the baby's nose. Here's a picture of that. Um, that one is fine too. No treatments needed. And normally they uh, disappear in about a few weeks or maybe it might even take a few months. So here's what I had said before. So it needs to be reported. All right, the gastrointestinal system. So that meconium, we talked about that before, that first stool. It's going to be sticky, thick, almost looks like tar. Should pass within 8 to 24 hours after birth. So you want to look at the color, amount, and consistency of the infant's stools to see and make sure that they look normal the way that they should be. Here's a picture of the normal infant cycle for when they are breastfeeding versus having um, formula fed. So here's just the different pictures of what they'll look like. So preventing infections. Uh, 
need to do, obviously, what we've always been talking about, hand hygiene. Also, knowing that the umbilical cord is a primary site for infection, so it's important to keep that clean. Uh, each facility or policies are going to have slight variations of what needs to be done to keep that clean, but some people may just put an alcohol wipe around it a couple times a day. They may dip cotton, um, cotton swabs in alcohol, different, you know, different things based off a of policy and what someone has at home. Um, but just know that that umbilical cord needs to be kept clean to prevent infection. So discharge teaching, we went over this in SimLab 2 on, on that discharge um, sheet and just making sure that that teaching begins even before that infant is born. So it, that gives the parents enough time to process the information, be able to ask questions if they can't remember or want more details. So when they go home, you want to teach the parents about proper feeding, uh, what to look for to make sure the infant's getting enough food, um, make sure when they put their baby in the crib that they don't have a lot of access, excessive uh, blankets or toys. It really should just be the infant um, in there and nothing more. They don't need a pillow or anything like that. Uh, you can instruct them about um, signs and symptoms to look for for diaper rash and what to do for that. And then you want to make sure and instruct the patients about um, back to sleep to prevent SIDS and then also the um, instructing them not to co-sleep with the infant. All right, so now chapter 13 is going to go over the issues that can occur with either a preterm or postterm newborn. So the preterm Birth is cause, it oh, is the cause of more deaths during the first year of life than any other single factor. So there's that with preterm infant, there's a high percentage of birth defects. And so the less that, less that the preterm infant weighs, the greater the risk of life during delivery and um, immediately after birth. All right, so we've said this before, preterm infant is less than 37 weeks. Post-term is um, after 42 weeks. So Ballard score, this is used to um, determine what the gestational age is. So this is good to use when a patient comes into the hospital in labor and she's had no prenatal care. So no so the doctors have no idea what that gestational age should be versus someone coming in with their prenatal visit uh, at eight weeks and they've had ultrasounds and fundal measurements to see where that infant's at. So the Ballard score is a nice tool to use when it's unknown when that baby or how old that baby is. So here's a picture. It's kind of hard to see because there's a lot going on. But there is a photo in your book as well that would be good to view and you then you can see a little bit more in deep or you can read a little bit better to see what they're assessing for with the Ballard score. So here are just a few char characteristics of that preterm infant. So a lot of times their skin is going to be transparent or loose. They're going to have lack of that subcutaneous fat, so that brown fat that we talked about too. They're not going to have as much of that, so they're going to have a harder time with temperature regulation. Um, their soles of their feet are going to have less creases. Uh, nails are going to be short, and the labia majora may be open in girls. So there's just lots of different little things you can look at to see if that infant is preterm or not. They're going to have a harder time with their respiratory function. So um, here are the changes that occur in that second half of pregnancy. So if an infant is born before term, they're not going to have these as much. So the abdomen is distended as well, increasing pressure on the diaphragm. Um, 
The gag and cough reflexes are going to be weak due to immature nerve supply. And stimulation of the respiratory center in the brain is immature as well. So they run the risk of having respiratory distress syndrome, RDS. So that's resulted from immature lungs, leads to decreased gas exchange. So surfactant is a fatty protein that's high in lectin and its presence is necessary for lungs to absorb oxygen. So if an infant is premature, that surfactant level is going to be insufficient. So if that's known, surfactant can be given as a medication to the infant after delivery to help with that. So signs and symptoms of RDS. It may take a few hours after birth for it to show, so that's why it's very important to continue to assess that infant frequently after delivery. Uh, respirations are going to increase to about 60 or higher. Uh, when those respirations increase, they may have those grunt sounds I talked about before. They may have nasal flaring. The infant may be cyanosis or have some of those um, external retractions. They may get anema, anem or edema and apnea. And then these infants are going to need to be on mechanical ventilation. So treatment. So an amniocentesis of the mother, um, while the fetus is still in utero, can show if there's low surfactant. So that's why the mom may get corticosteroids to stimulate lung maturity um, one to two days before delivery. And that's that the most common one given is the beta-methasone. So it's important in the neonate's lung function is generally seen within 72 hours after emission or improvement of the lung function. So surfactant production in the infant can be altered due to cold stress, hypoxia, or poor tissue perfusion. So what's the nursing care that needs to be done for these infants? Vital signs need to be monitored frequently. Cluster care. So this means that when you're taking care of an infant during this time, you want to make sure that you're doing everything at the same time. So you're going to be changing the diaper, doing the feedings, doing your assessment, um, or any you know trying to get those medications in during that time as well. So doing that all at once, so then you can give the infant a good, you know, three, maybe even four hours of sleep before cares need, need to be done again. So that's what cluster care means. Uh, these infants may need to be on an IV. So it's important to assess for under or overnutrition or overhydration. So that would be um, actually like measuring the abdomen, measuring the, the head as well, are going to help with some of those signs and also looking and weighing the diapers as well. And they may need to be on oxygen therapy, so they need to have a continuous pulse ox oximeter on. And it's infant on oxygen is at a higher risk of oxygen toxicity. So it's very important to monitor, monitor these and make sure that they're at the level that needs to be them. All right, so then uh, looking at BPD, that's a toxic response of lungs to oxygen therapy. So risks that can occur is going to be collapse or closure of the lung, edema, or thickening of membranes and interferes with ventilation. So it's a result of prolonged dependence on that supplemental oxygen and ventilators. So unfortunately, these um, oftentimes have long-term complications. So apnea on the preterm infant. So what apnea is, is that it's a cessation of breathing for 20 seconds or longer. It's not uncommon in preterms uh, infants, so it's something that you want to look for. So it can be accompanied by cyanosis or bradycardia. So nursing interventions. The first thing you're going to want to do is, is rub those infants' feet and back to see if you can simulate that breathing after the incurrence. If that doesn't work, then you would want to 
try and suction with a bulb syringe. Uh, so if that first intervention is unsuccessful, and if that doesn't work, then um, an AMBU bag may be needed or other interventions. So neonatal hypoxia, that's inadequate oxygen. So it can be measured by the pulse oximeter. So this is a little bit different than your average adult. Saturation levels of 92% or above is normal. So that seems a little bit different. I know 92 does seem a little bit low, but that's okay for an infant. So very anemic infants may have uh, severe hypoxia and not manifest the clinical symptoms. So it's important to kind of be aware of that. And then so abnormal hemoglobin can also um, cause hypoxia because the fetal hemoglobin does not readily release oxygen to the tissues and end organs. So sepsis in the infant is a generalized infection of the bloodstream. That would be if it can occur for multiple different reasons. Um, it could be from different interventions that are done if the infant needs to go in the NICU, or it could be an infection from the mom and the infant gets it and that infant isn't delivered in time. So some symptoms are going to include low temperature, um, they're going to be lethargic or irritable, poor feedings, and then also respiratory distress. So treatments, IV antibiotics, make sure that that infant stays warm and well and has enough nutrition. Vital signs need to be monitored frequently. Um, this is also the, that cluster care needs to be done to conserve as much energy. So, and then also doing that strict hand hygiene. So poor control body temperature. So lack of brown fat. That's that baby, that body's own insulation. So term infants have a good amount of brown fat stored up. So that helps with their temperature. But preterm infants may not have that brown fat or as much brown fat. So they're at a greater risk of having um, decreased temperature um, issues. So heat regulating center of the brain is immature with these preterm infants as well. And the sweat glands aren't working the way that they should. So... Um, And then a high metabolism prone to low blood sugar levels can result in cold stress. So signs and symptoms of cold stress. Decreased skin temperature, increased respiration rates with apnea, bradycardia, modeling of the skin. And here's a picture of what modeling looks like. And then the infants can be very tired as well. And to... Assess if an infant's tired, that would be if it's been a couple hours, they're ready to feed, you have to wake the infant up to feed, and they may be awake for a little bit as you try to feed them, and then they continue to fall asleep and having poor suck from that feeding. Those are some signs you're going to be looking for with the infant being lethargic. So nursing care for that poor body, con uh, body temperature control. So infant going to skin to skin, that's a great way to be able to regulate that temperature. Um, placing them under radiant warmer, that also, so radiant warmer is going to get that body temperature to exactly where they need it. And there's actually a little, um, kind of like a sticker that they can put right on the infant's body. That's, and there's a wire that's hooked up to the warmer that actually, um, says what the infant's temperature is continuously. So then you can um, adjust the warmer up or down to get that infant's temperature to exactly where you want it to be. And then that incubator, that's the ones that you see where that infant is completely enclosed. That's going to help with that infant's temperature to get them to that optimal level of 97.1 to 98.6. Okay, so some issues that um, preterm infants can have, and this is also with an infant that maybe was born with um, a gestational diabetic mom or 
an infant that's large for gestational age or small for gestational age, but also to preterm infants run the risk of being hypoglycemic. So that is considered if anything is on, if their glucose is under 40 in a term infant and under 30 in a preterm infant. So preterm infants have not remained in utero long enough to build up stores of glycogen and fat. So any condition that increases metabolism increases glucose needs. So energy requirements place more stress on the already deficient stores. So it's important for the nurse to check those glucose um, frequently. So signs of hypoglycemia is going to be uh, tremors, a weak cry, but that cry is going to be high pitch. They're going to be lethargic, and they might even have convulsions. So now looking at hypocalcemia. So calcium transport across the placenta is in higher qualities in the third trimester. So if an infant's born prematurely, they're not going to have as much calcium as they need. So early hypocalcemia occurs when the um, parathyroid fails to respond to the preterm infant's low calcium levels. Then light, late hypocalcemia occurs about one week in infants who are fed cow's milk as it increases serum phosphate levels, causing serum calcium levels to fail. So an infant should never be fed cow's milk. Um, it can be treated by giving IV calcium gluconate. So um, it's important to obviously monitor lots of different things, but during that IV therapy, you really want to assess for bradycardia because that is a um, issue that can occur that um, needs to be closely monitored. All right, so preterm infants are also increased with the tendency to bleed. Um, the nursing care includes monitoring their neurostatus. You want to, they want to make sure that they're reporting any of those bulging fontanelles, um, lethargy, poor feedings, maybe even seizures. Um, the infant should be in slight follower's position to help with that. And then um, unnecessary stimulation can increase intracranial or intracerebral pressure. So it's important to um, handle these infants with care. All right, another issue is um, retinopathy, ROP. Separation and um, fibrous of the retina can lead to blindness. So this occurs with damage to immature retinal blood vessels thought to be caused by high oxygen levels in um, the blood. So is the level of oxygen in the blood rather than the amount of oxygen received as important in oxygen therapy? So it's the leading cause of blindness in infants weighing less than 1,500 grams, maintaining sufficient levels of vitamin E, and avoiding excessive high concentrations of oxygen may help prevent ROP from occurring, and then cryosurgery may reduce long-term complications. Premature infants are also at an increased risk of poor nutrition. Their stomachs are smaller. Um, sphincters at either end of the stomach are immature. They have an increased risk of regurgitation and vomiting. They have poor suck and swallow reflexes. Ability to absorb fat is poor as well. And then that increased need for glucose and other nutrients to promote growth and prevent brain damage are contributing factors. And um, gavage feedings may be needed until infant systems are more mature. So gavage feedings are just, um, just feedings through um, an OG or an NG tube. Another issue that can occur is um, necrotizing endocolitis, referred to as NEC. It's the acute inflammation of the bowel that leads to bowel necrosis. So factors include diminished blood supply to the bowel lining, which leads to hypoxia or sepsis and causes a decrease in protective mucus. 
So it results in, basically the result is in bacterial invasion. The sources of some of that bacterial growth is receiving a uh, milk formula or hypertonic gavage feedings. Signs of neck are going to include abdominal distension, which is why it's important for nurses to be measuring that abdomen during their assessments, bloody stools, diarrhea, and then bilious vomitus, and that is just vomiting of the actual bile, and so that color is going to be either like yellow or green, or like a yellowish green color is what you're going to be assessing for. So what are the nursing care? Measuring that abdomen, also tating for bowel sounds, um, resuming fluids as ordered, maintaining infection prevention and control techniques, and then surgical removal may need to occur of the necrosis bowel. Infants are going to have immature kidneys when they're preterm, so they cannot eliminate body waste effectively, so can contribute to electrolyte imbalances. Dehydration is common, uh, and then susceptibility to edema is increased. So you want to make sure that the there's going to be a lot of times preterm infants are on strict I and O, so every diaper needs to be weighed. Urine output should be between 1 and 3 milligrams per kilogram for an hour. Signs and symptoms of dehydration or overhydration need to be uh, looked at. And then um, during the assessment, the fontanelles, skin turgor, weight, and urinary output all need to be part of that. So infants are more likely to be jaundiced as well. Immature liver contribute to um, conditions and causes the skin and whites of the eyes to assume a yellow-orange cast. Liver is unable to clear blood of bile pigments, which results from the normal postnatal destruction of ripe red blood cells. So the higher the serum bilirubin level, the higher the jaundice and the greater risk of neurological damage. So even term infants, any infant, can get jaundice. So term infants also have it as well. It's just that preterm infants are at a greater risk and it's uh, more likely to occur. But any infant could develop jaundice. So it's considered an increase of over 5 milligrams per deciliter in 24 hours or a bilirubin level above 12.9. So that needs to be um, looking at to see if it's increasing, what's going on. Um, breastfed infants can show sign of jaundice about four days after birth. And that total serum bilirubin levels um, normally are at their peak around three to five days after birth. So each infant does get assessed for at, with bilirubin levels. It can be done either through a heel stick and getting blood from the infant, or there is a transcutaneous uh, Billy Rubin device that actually is just put right on the infant's skin and it's just like a little reader kind of like um, it looks almost like one of those temperatures that goes right on someone's forehead and can check it that's kind of what it looks like so it's not invasive at all and that is all that's used to check what the Billy Rubin level is as well so if they do have high Billy Rubin there's different things that can that uh, interventions that can occur. Uh, it's important that that infant is still breastfeeding or bottle feeding that helps uh, break down that bilirubin. Also, too, they may have to go on something called a, a phototherapy. Uh, so they have a bilirubin light that's on that helps break down that bilirubin as well. And if it's not lowered in time before discharge, some infants do go home on a bilirubin light and that's, you know, just there's extra teaching that's involved with the parents on how to um, take care of an infant on a belly light. So the nursing care goals need to include observe for the skin, mucous membranes for signs of jaundice, report the progression of jaundice from the face to the abdomen and feet, monitor and report any abnormal lab results, and then how that infant is responding to that phototherapy. 
So glucose water feeding should not be offered since this can further increase bilirubin levels. Glucose feeding, water feeding shouldn't really be offered at all anymore except for what we talked about for just some of that pain relief during a circumcision or other procedures. So some special needs that a nurse needs to um, have goals for that preterm newborn. All of the things that we talked about uh, previously, improve respiration, maintain body heat, conserve that energy, prevent infection, proper nutrition and hydration, skin care, and observe infant carefully and record observations and support and encourage the parents. So that's important too. It can be very frustrating for the parents um, that have an infant in the NICU. It's uh, something that was unexpected from their delivery and um, it can be tough on them to not be able to, to go home and be discharged and not go home with their infant can be um, very tough on these parents. So just providing that support for them um, and just seeing, you know, trying to do as much as you can for them and letting that, that parent do a lot with the infant when they come to visit as well. So I uh, talked a little bit about those incubators, but to go a little bit further, so a stable body temperature is essential to survival and management of preterm infants. So it's important for the nurse to know how to use those various types of incubators available and to provide a safe and effective care to the incubated infant. And here's a picture of um, a, a radiant heat warmer that you saw during sim lab when we put that infant underneath it. So there's the heat that's, um, that's on there. So it's important to uh, check their temperatures frequently when they're under that radiant warmer to make sure that they're not too hot, especially if they're swaddled in the blanket with a hat on and under the warmer, they can easily get overheated. So here's a picture of what skin to skin looks like. Uh, it's called kangaroo care. And um, that article that you're reading for the last discussion will go into detail of the benefits of kangaroo care. And the reason I put this picture on here is to show that uh, skin to skin and kangaroo care can be done with infants that are in the NICU or a uh, special care nursery. It doesn't have to be just for term infants. So this infant's you know, hooked up to a CPAP, has um, an OG in, and has lots going on, but that mom can still hold the infant and still do skin to skin. So nutrition for the preterm infant. So they may need to have those gavage feedings that we talked about, their parental feedings. Um, they may need to have um, the mom a lot of times will pump and bring the breast milk into the NICU. And then either she or the care provider, the nurse, will feed the infant that breast milk. Um, or if they're on formula, there's lots of different kinds out there that a nurse practitioner or neonatologist will order depending on what the infant specifically needs. Um, early initiation of feedings helps reduce the risk of hypoglycemia, hyperbilirubemia, and dehydration, and gavage feedings are needed due to weak or absent sucking or swallowing reflex. So nursing care related to that nutrition. Observe and record bowel sounds and passions of meconium. Uh, for gavage feeding, uh, the nurse needs to aspirate uh, for gastric content prior to feeding the newborn. Uh, if there's no residual received, it's safe to start the feeding. And if a higher than ordered limit of gavage contents is received when they're pulling back, the feeding may need to be held and the healthcare provider notified because that infant is not digesting the food that they, how they should be. So growth rate nears uh, the term infants about the second year of life, but very low birth weight infants may not catch up, especially if chronic illness, insufficient nutritional intake, or inadequate caregiving has occurred. So growth and development of preterm infant are based on current age minus the number of weeks 
before term the infant was born. So this calculation helps prevent unrealistic expectations for the infant. So I talked briefly about the parents and the family reaction when they have a preterm infant. So uh, they may need um, counseling or um, just guidance throughout the infant's hospitalization. Um, unfortunately, they may blame themselves for the infant's condition of saying, you know, the mom may say, well, if I did this or if I did that, maybe I wouldn't have gone into preterm labor. Maybe if I didn't, um, maybe if I went down to part-time for work when I was pregnant, maybe that would have helped. So there's always going to be those parents that are always saying the what if. Um, also, the concern of taking care of the infant, especially when they're discharged from um, the hospital and they're taking care of this preterm infant, there's still a lot of things they may have to do medical-wise for the infant, even after discharge, and that can be very overwhelming and daunting to the parents. So, um, you know, it's really important to provide the right support that they need and um, also, too, like going to support groups where they're um, meeting up and talking with other parents in similar situations can be helpful. So now going the opposite way with the post-term newborn, so that's beyond 42 weeks, um, that placenta does not function as well, can, so that can result in fetal distress. The mortality rate of later term infants is higher than that of term infants. So um, it's important that these women are induced, you know, after, normally after like they'll be induced if they don't deliver close to their due date and it, they're at 41 weeks, they'll, they'll be induced. You don't really want a mom to go past 42 weeks. So problems associated, um, they can have a lack of oxygen, meconium aspiration is increased. Uh, poor nutritional status, increase in blood, red blood cell production, difficult delivery because the infant has been growing even more, so they're bigger, uh, birth defects, and then also seizures can occur. So some characteristics of the preterm newborn. Long and thin, so their weight may have been lost, actually, so skin is loose. Um, they're not going to have as much burnix, so their skin is dry cracks and there might be peeling. Nails are long and may, be, may actually be stained with that meconium depending on when that infant passed the meconium. And there's going to be lots of hair, not all the time, but um, some of the time, and that infant's going to look um, very alert. So nursing care, you want to um, have a close observation of respiratory distress. There is increased risk of hypoglycemia hyperbilirubinia, and cold stress. So how does the nurse assess each of these conditions? It's kind of what we've already talked about. If you go back from your slides of looking at how do you assess for respiratory distress, how you assess for hypoglycemia, what are those signs and symptoms of hypoglycemia? You have a high-pitched cry, a weak cry, tremors. What are those signs and symptoms of high bilirubin? All of those things you want to be looking at. So occasionally, depending on the facility and what type of NICU they have, or if they have a NICU at all, the infant may need to be transferred to another hospital. So it's important that that infant is stabilized before they're transferred. These infants can either be transferred via ambulance, or they may have to be uh, via helicopter, depending on where they need to go. So baseline data, such as vital signs and blood work, should be obtained and provided to the support transfer team. And then copy of all medical records, including the mother's prenatal history and how the delivery progressed. So here's just a little interesting fact I threw in here. Um, if the infant's not doing well and it looks like this, that infant may not survive, the nurse can actually, actually baptize the infant if, um, if that's important to the parents. So I thought that was kind of cool. If there's not time for a priest to come and, or a chaplain to come and baptize, the nurse can do it. So when they're transferring the infant, you want to show the infant is properly identified and that the mother has the same identification number. 
provide parents with name and location of the NICU, the infants being transferred to, including telephone numbers. If possible, allow the parents a few moments with their infant prior to transport. If possible, take a picture of the baby and give to parents. The discharge of the high-risk newborn. So that begins at birth. Parents will need to demonstrate and practice routine and or specialized care. Home nursing visits may be required. And the newborn's behavioral patterns are discussed and realistic expectations are re reviewed. So some of these patients that are being discharged from the NICU from being very preterm or from other conditions, it's important to let the parents know what long-term effects can occur so that they're prepared for it. Um, they may have developmental delays, um, physical um, issues in the sense that, you know, these, these patients may have um, different issues going on for the rest of their lives. So communication can be maintained with the hospital. So um, when the parents, you know, they can still call the hospital with questions or the clinic, wherever, it, or the, however they're um, taught on who they need to call with questions. Social services uh, may be able to help in ensuring that the home environment is um, set up for the special needs of the infant. Also, they should be um, referred to support groups. And a lot of times these, pa these parents need to be um, get a CPR certification to know what they need to do in case they need to with the infant at home. All right, so that is it for chapters 12 and 13. Uh, just either send me an email if you have any questions, or we can discuss those questions before class this week.